a warm welcome to everybody. Um, and thank you all for joining us as we apply our minds, share our experience of and approach to a decolonizing and democratic pedagogy. I'm Melissa Levine, the chair of today's session, and I'm currently located at the University of Toronto. The land acknowledgement for this place is as follows. Um, I, or we, wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it's been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. I begin all my classes in African Studies, which is the program I teach in, with this land acknowledgement, and a conversation with students about its strengths and its limitations, as well as its importance as we begin our studies on the history, the political and social life uh, of the African continent. In our discussions, students tend to extend the acknowledgement to a commitment to working towards the fundamental transformation of relations of inequity that persist between the settler state and indigenous nations and peoples here and against persistent coloniality of institutions globally. Indeed, this Zoom technology brings us together from all over the place, but doesn't transport us into a transcendent world. So as we sit here today from all over the place, we can all acknowledge the spaces of coloniality in which we operate. And speaking of those multiple locations, it would be really wonderful to get a sense of where everyone is joining from. Um, JC, if we can maybe post a poll and we can see where everyone's joining us from today so we can get a sense of um, who we're speaking with. And while you're filling out the poll, I'll tell you a little bit about this project, this Participedia project that has organized this teaching event, this teaching cafe event. So Participedia is a global research community and actually is the world's largest uh, crowdsourcing platform uh, exploring democratic innovations. Um, the current phase of the project is funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada and is led by one of our panelists, Professor Bonnie Ibawo, who's at McMaster University. Participedia brings together hundreds of researchers and collaborators from universities and organizations across all continents. Uh, centered on the principles of collaboration and co-design, this community works in research clusters to explore six key themes, including participatory governance, democratic accountability and representation, human and political rights, democracy across borders, and digital democracy. Uh, the Participedia project is collectively governed by a set of standing committees, including the teaching, training, and mentoring committee, which is the host of this teaching cafe event. And the teaching cafes themselves provide a space for community members, practitioners, and students to come together and develop teaching and learning practices by sharing experiences. And as you know, Today, we are exploring democratic and decolonial pedagogies in higher education. Our panelists for the day include Participedia Director, Dr. Bonnie Ibawo and Student Research Assistant, Sarah Abdella from McMaster University, as well as Professor Kathy Walker, who's an Assistant Professor in Political Studies at the University of Saskatchewan and Azusena Moran, who's a research associate at the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam. Each panel panelist will be allotted five minutes to speak on the above mentioned theme and the following guiding questions. Firstly, what informs your practice or what is your practice towards decolonizing democratic education or decolonizing and democratic education in the classroom or elsewhere? And secondly, what inspires you in the classroom or elsewhere? And how do you confront systemic challenges in advancing decolonial approaches to learning about, studying, and teaching democracy? 
we are organizing the panel. We have organized the panel really scientifically um, in alphabetical order. <laughs> so, and in alphabetical order from first name. So each panelist will start with Azucena. Each panelist will have five minutes. And after the panelists have spoken, we're going to open up the floor for questions and comments. And hopefully we'll have about half an hour for that discussion, which I look very forward to. And just before we begin, a very special thanks. In fact, an enormous thanks to Jesse Carson, Jennifer Wallace, and Paul Emelianovich, uh, A Million Villages, for their intellectual and technical contributions to this cafe. Uh, indeed, without them, this would not have happened. So thank you all very much. And thank you to everyone for joining us. And uh, over to you, Azucena. Thank you so much for the invitation. Really glad to be here. I mean, I apologize in advance because my my five minutes might be more towards raising questions and than giving responses, but I think it, it might be a good opener. Um, so when I first read the title of this talk, when you when you invited me, I immediately thought about um, one person. And I, at the beginning, I was like, should I should I talk about him or not? And then I decided I would uh, very briefly. Um, his name is Francisco Estrada. I knew him as Padre Paco. Um, he was one of the survivors of the um, massacre at the Central American University in El Salvador in 1989 um, by the US-backed Salvadoran military. Um, he was also the head of the school that I went to uh, growing up in Guatemala and perhaps one of the most exceptional human beings I've ever met. Um, and then there are a thousand things that he taught me, but um, one thing really uh, stood out to me when I started teaching a class at the University of Potsdam and also when I received the email invitation for this um, for this space. Um, and that was that all the knowledge we gather, uh, hold and spread, all of our professional growth is really worth nothing if it's not uplifting, if it's not accountable, and if it's not responsive to others and to the social struggles for justice. So how do we make our teaching break the boundaries between theory and praxis? And who are we teaching to and where? Who are we collaborating with and who are we accountable to? And who, who are we learning from and from where, from which place? So I don't have a really definitive answer for all of these questions, uh, of course, but I would like to reflect on a point that has been very important for me um, lately, uh, that is to take care of and be responsible of the knowledge we are producing and how that translates into praxis. So there is um, fascinating research done by Andres Castro and Diego Alvarez Gutierrez around a mechanism through which Western knowledge is rendered universal. So basically they, what they did is that they grabbed half a million um, social science articles um, and they were looking at very something very specific when they were analyzing this. Uh, they were looking at the, at the titles basically of these journal articles. Um, and in doing so, they discovered that most articles focusing on processes, on cases or on phenomena in the global north uh, do not really mention the name of the country or the region they're studying in the title of the paper. Um, and this implies that the results basically of the paper are rendered universal. And in turn, articles that focus on processes or phenomena in the global south tend to be considered peripheral or systemically prone to add the name of the title or of the region in the title of the paper. And what does this imply? Basically, they argue that this implies non-universality Ethno theory and not theory. Um, and this gives, and I quote, an unwarranted claim on universality to articles focusing on the global north and may lead to lesser recognition of global south studies. And here we're talking about the majority world. So when we teach about deliberative and participatory democracy, which theories are we rendering universal? Which dominant design practices based on which case studies are we saying will cure the failures of not only democracies in the Western world, which we talk a lot about, about is autocratizing trends, but we should also remember that they keep ranking among the, you know, the, the highest levels of democracies worldwide. Um, but which dominant design practices are we saying that they're not only going to cure these failures, but also cure the failures of the majority world, of the democracies of the majority world. Another article by Jonathan Morales, uh, Regina Solis and others, looks specifically into one field that is um, really important for my research, but also very important in times of 
well, in terms of the ecological crisis um, in one of the regions that will be most affected by it, that is Central America. Um, and they basically, they look at the top 10 um, countries producing knowledge about Central American biodiversity. Um, and they realize that only Panama and Costa Rica are next to the whole lot of European North American countries in these top 10 countries. So of that studying biodiversity in Central America. So Nicaragua, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, the countries with the lowest democratic indicators in the region are not present there. They're not present in the top 10 countries studying biodiversity in the region. And they then show us these numbers. There are 13 researchers per million people in Guatemala, the most populated Central American country, compared to 4,412 researchers per million people in the US, 5,393 researchers per million people in Germany, 4,516 in Canada. And let's go back again to Guatemala, 13 researchers per million people in Guatemala. So who can conduct research in Central America? Which stories are we reproducing and putting in our syllabi? Which theories are we making universal? Who can tell our stories and from where? And how can that research relate to the struggles in the majority world for land back, for democratization, for peace, for justice, for reparations? I could go on. And there's obviously no definitive response, and there are still so many open questions. But I think two steps could be to first question the universality of what we're teaching and to look at the different forms in which knowledge is reproduced. So not only within Western countries, but also in the, West, in the majority world. So we can center and not only complement what we teach. And second, to be more creative in the ways that our teaching doesn't only relate, but it's really accountable to praxis, and not just to scientific knowledge production. Thank you. Just in time, Melissa. Actually, you've got more time. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Asina. Um, okay, next, uh, Bunny Ibawo. Well, thank you very much, uh, Melissa, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, it's really exciting to be part of this conversation on a very important topic. So I'm going to frame my brief remarks today around two or three questions, actually three questions. Uh, and, and they center on what we mean when we talk about decolonizing dem democratic pedagogies. I want to begin with really problematizing the concept of decolonization, uh, because very often we think about it in very abstract terms. And I want to bring it back to colonization, uh, because ontologically speaking, uh, the term decolonization is meaningless without colonization. Uh, if decolonization is dismantling the structures of colonialism, we really need to have a robust understanding of the colonial experience to be able to deconstruct it. And I worry that so much of the conversation about decolonization, whether it is in reference to the academy or to pedagogies or to democracy, seems disentangled, disconnected, from that foundational experience, which is the colonial experience. So I want to bring us back to that because that's the starting point, the colonial, the hierarchies of colonialism, the subjugation of colonialism, the oppression of colonialism. All attempts, all discourses of decolonization must be grounded on that experience. So I proceed from that premise that to understand how to decolonize democratic pedagogies. We need to go a bit back to the colonial experience. And what that tells me is that we have to begin with trying to dismantle our ways of knowing. Uh, okay, so pedagogies are essentially about ways in which we teach. Uh, it is the process of how knowledge and skills are imparted in an educational context. That's the classic dictionary definition of pedagogies ways of impacting knowledge. But I would argue that the ways of impacting knowledge ultimately uh, have a lot to do with the ways of knowing, the ways of understanding, the ways of interpreting, because we can only teach what we know, what we understand, what we can comprehend. Even the ways we teach reflects the ways we know. 
So a conversation about how we teach and how we learn must out of necessity be accompanied, or I would even argue, be preceded by conversations about the ways we know, the ways we understand, and the ways we interpret. So here is my key proposition. How do we decolonize democracy? How do we decolonize democratic pedagogies? Which is what the question is today. I would argue there are four ways that I can think about. There might be many others, but I want to frame my answer to this question in four ways. The first is to strengthen democracy. So we are all here having this conversation, but I think we need to think why. Why do we need this conversation? And the first one is we need to strengthen democracy. Uh, we need to address the representational blind spots of democracy. So it is important to stress that when we talk about decolonizing democracy or democratic pedagogies, it is not inherently a repudiation of the normative foundations of democracy. In fact, I would argue in many ways, it is a call to strengthen it, to make it live out the full meaning of its of, of what the idea of democracy is. So that's one, strengthening democracy and addressing its representational blind spots. Two, dismantling colonial epistemological hegemonies and hierarchies. Uh, so that's why this is necessary, towards a more inclusive way of knowing, uh, towards a more inclusive way of understanding the world. That's why this project is necessary. Three, opening spaces for indigenous ways of knowing indigenous pedagogies. And this is really important. And it goes back to my earlier points about centering the discourse on decolonization on the colonial experience. So whose voices are missing? It's the indigenous voice, it's the voice of the locals, it's the voice of the oppressed, what Paulo Ferro will call the pedagogy of the oppressed. Uh, and that is what we need to recover. So we shouldn't forget that. And then finally, meeting the contemporary challenges of governance. We need to decolonize democratic pedagogies because we all realize that there are challenges that need to be met, whether it's the climate crisis, whether it's pandemic preparedness, whether it's the rise of toxic social media communication or populist nationalism. The world confronts very grave and sometimes unprecedented challenges. And I would argue that it is an urgent need uh, for us to think about how to strengthen democracy to meet these needs. So how do we go about this? Now that we've talked about why, here is the how. Uh, how do we do this? I would say one of the ways we do this is to link decolonization to self-determination. So normatively, the essence of decolonization is self-determination. People having a say in how their world is ordered. Decolonizing pedagogies, therefore, implies providing spaces for individuals and communities to have a say in determining what they learn and how they learn. This includes dismantling ways of knowing, teaching, and learning that have been imposed on them, especially when this knowledge is about themselves. Um, and I'm drawing here on that uh, very classic article by Tok and Yang, uh, decolonization is not a metaphor. And I like to quote something they wrote in that article published in 2012 that really strikes me each time I talk about decolonization. A decolonizing approach aims to resist and undo the forces of colonialism and to reestablish indigenous nationhood. It is rooted in indigenous values, philosophies, and knowledge systems. It is a way of doing things differently that challenges the colonial influences that indigenous people have historically lived under by making space for the marginalized indigenous perspective. And for me, that is really the essence of the project when we think about decolonizing uh, pedagogy. So the third phase, uh, what does it look like? So I've been talking about the why, I've talked about a bit about the how, what does this look like? What will a decolonized pedagogy look like? And I'm going back to the point Melissa made in the introduction about us speaking about how we attempt to do this. And nobody has a blueprint. We're all trying to figure this out. And I will speak to how I try to do that. So when I design my courses, I teach international human rights. And I teach peace and conflict studies. And I teach 
imperialism, I always start by trying to question the taken for granted concepts and terminology that we proceed for. So I don't go into my human rights course by assuming we agree on what it means. I start by saying, what is human rights? Where did the language come from? Who framed the language? Who was excluded when this language was framed? What are, this, what are the promises and what are the limitations? So it challenged the very foundation around which the concept that we're working with is framed. So I question spoken and unspoken assumptions about normative value and objectivity. Considering the normative values, limitations, exclusions of concepts like democracy and human rights, the history of what has been done in the name of democracy. And this is really important, not just the history of human rights, but the history of what has been done in the name of human rights, whether they affirm the normative value of human rights or not. Not just democracy, but the history of what has been done in the name of democracy of civilization, um, of the burden of the colonizer. So all of these are part of the conversation and they don't come at the end as an afterthought. They shape the entire discourse. We proceed from that. So, and I'll give you very practical examples. So anti-colonial activists, were they radicals? Were they democratic radicals? Were they opposed to democracy? Yes, they were radicals, but radical for who? They were radical if you write the history from the perspective of the colonizing power that I can show you for the millions who supported them in the agitation for independence, whether in Africa or Asia or Turtle Island, they were not radicals. They were reasonable. They were mainstream. So we have to think about whose lens, and this is something I'm sure many of us are familiar with, uh, who's writing, when are they writing, how are they writing, and positionality of the authors. So when I take a look at my course outline, I always ask myself, who are my students reading? Am I just choosing the authors that are easily accessible? And we know as professors, we have to expose our students to the canonical works. It's important, whether they're going into academia or they're just going into the workforce, they have to know the canonical works. Yes, they need to know about the enlightenment, about the liberal philosophers, about all these thought leaders that shaped liberal democracy, but they need to know a little bit more. They need to know about those who also challenged that notion of liberal democracy because it was very exclusive, at least in its origins. So I think about who am I exposing my students to beyond just the canons. And sometimes it means a little bit more work to find these writers. They might not be published in the most prestigious journals. They might not be published by the most prestigious academic presses, but they are there. And it's our responsibilities as instructors, as teachers, to excavate them, to dig out these voices and expose them to our students. And so that is what I try to do. And that is what I think about when I think about decolonizing uh, democratic pedagogies, that we think about who's writing, but that we also make an effort to put before our students, to put before our learners, those whose voices have been historically silenced and marginalized. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ibao. Um, and on to, Professor Walker. Okay, so I can keep this well under five minutes and just say what he said. <laughs> yeah, exactly, what he said. <laughs> that was really beautiful, Bonnie. Um, so I'm mostly gonna speak to the question of what informs my practice or uh, my practice towards democratic education uh, in the classroom or elsewhere. So the short answer to that question is life informs my practice. So, you know, as much as we try to separate education and life from one another, um, from most Indigenous perspectives, life is our education. So I think that more specifically, this means that we can think of the classroom as a microcosm of a democratic society. So the good news about thinking in this way is that we can apply everything we know about democratic 
theory and practice to our teaching. Um, the bad news is that we can apply everything we know about democratic teaching <laughs> and democratic theory and uh, practices to our teaching. So I say this is also bad news because it, it involves a lot of work uh, on, on our parts, right? So just as transformative change in a democratic society often comes from civil and not so civil disobedience to governing rules and norms, this is the same case in academic settings. So do democratic theorists and teachers have to be civilly disobedient in academic settings to decolonize their teaching? I think to a large extent, the answer is yes, because bringing a feminist, decolonial, queer, and anti-racist lens to democratic education often does require breaking uh, academic rules and norms. And it's not an easy task, it's not easy work. Okay, but let's focus on the good news. Collectively, we know a lot about decolonizing democratic theory and practice that we can apply to the classroom. So with the time I have left, I'm gonna to try to bridge not only decolonization and democracy, but society and the classroom with some illustrative teaching examples. So if I go over time, just mute me, <laughs> just cut me off. <laughs> so Godre and Lawrence um, published an article in 2018 uh, based on interviews with 25 Indigenous scholars from across Canada who were working in various academic settings. And they asked these scholars to identify uh, decolonizing practices in the academy. And after analyzing all the responses, uh, Godry and Lawrence concluded that decolonization in academic settings is taking place in a continuum. And I actually think that democratic systems, as most of us know, also fall along a continuum, with some, democ some democracies being you know, more democratic than others. So in the academic context, at one end of the continuum is inclusion. So this is basically more brown faces in white spaces, essentially. Um, so uh, basically the authors found that indigenous inclusion is actually still the predominant approach in, in most post-secondary institutions in Canada. But inclusion has the potential to be transformative when everyone in the institution goes farther and farther to push for, for systemic change. And so to put this into democratic vernacular, um, I'm borrowing the work of uh, the venerable democratic theorist that most of us are familiar with, uh, Mark Warren, who talks about when inclusion is empowered or when those included also have the powers, and this is in democratic context, when those included also have the powers of speaking, voting, representing, and dissenting, and such empowerments are distributed equally, then you have empowered inclusion. And this means that all affected have equal rights and protections to act and speak. So Godry and Lawrence actually call um, empowered inclusions reconciliation indigenization in academic context. And they actually place it, and in the continuum, they place it as a step up from inclusion. And so they, they regard this type of indigenization as requiring power sharing, a transformation of decision-making processes, and a reintegration of Indigenous peoples, faculty, staff, and students into academic policymaking that affects them. So what does this look like in the classroom, though? So for me, I feel like what this means is really empowering Indigenous authors and perspectives to speak in your classroom. So uh, by way of an example, in my first uh, year course called Democratic Citizenship in Canada, I not only included Indigenous authors and, and perspectives, but I actually added it as a learning objective for the course. So my, my specific LO was 
understanding Indigenous perspectives and applications of key Western political concepts. And so every week, I included short readings, examples, or podcasts and videos on democracy from Indigenous authors or perspectives, and many of them were critical. And also in the classroom, power sharing can mean going further still with inclusion to include Indigenous methodologies in the classroom. So again, one thing I did was I revised all of my paper outlines for all my courses to uh, enable all students, undergraduate and graduate, to include oral histories and narratives from elders and knowledge keepers in their papers as potential sources. So um, again, I'm probably breaking a major academic norm here, but oh well. Um, so the U of A actually just came out this year with an academic guide on how to cite Indigenous and knowledge keepers. So I mean, it's already, they're already, you know, uh, institutionalizing it. So there you go. Um, Another thing I do is I also encourage students to bring their ancestors and their relatives into their learning. And I do this through a simple introductory exercise that I adapted from Stolo scholar Joanne Archibald and Native Hawaiian and American scholar uh, Hokalani K. Eku, who's now at the University of Victoria. I won't get into it though, because then that'll use up my last minute. <laughs> I also had students do a political uh, landmarks paper where they had to go and find a physical landmark in their environment and analyze what history or narrative it's telling them about democracy in Canada. And they also had to take a picture of it. And so this helped them understand, again, the power of context and place uh, in, in democratic uh, citizenship. So in terms of empowering students also to be decision makers in the classroom, I have heard of some instructors that really encourage students to design their own adventure and provide options to students for how they want to be assessed and so on. So I've I haven't done this as much, but I have incorporated uh, peer reviews, which I think work really, really well. Um, Okay, so now one of the downsides to this approach, though, of reconciliation and indigenization is that often Indigenous and like-minded faculty tend to bear the burden for transformative change. And Indigenous epistemies still tend to be unconditionally welcome only to a handful of marginal spaces that are often insignificant to the academy at large. And so what we have is a lack of collective policies that aim to uproot the established epistemological privilege of the Western tradition. And so this brings us to the last stop in the continuum, or what Gaudry and Lawrence call decolonial indigenization. And what, um, again, using Mark Warren as the translator in democratic parlance, uh, Mark would requires another requirement for a system to be truly democratic or the need for collective agendas and wills. So this means that once the interests, values, perspectives, and preferences of individuals or classes of individuals are included, they need to be formed through communication into collective agendas and wills. And of course, this requires practices of deliberation. And so again, back to the university context, decolonial indigenization means the university is fundamentally transformed by deep engagement, dare I say deliberation, with indigenous peoples, indigenous intellectuals, and indigenous knowledge systems for all who attend. So again, this is quite an endeavor. It envisions the wholesale overhaul of the academy to fundamentally reorient knowledge production based on balancing power relations between indigenous peoples and all Canadians and transforming the academy into something dynamic and new. So what might that look like in the classroom? Well, I can't give you any examples from my own teaching because I haven't been able to do that <laughs> yet, but I do have one example. I think it looks like uh, this one treaty poetics course that's uh, been co-taught actually for five years now by associate professor and settler scholar, Christine Stewart, 
and by elder and knowledge keeper, uh, Nehiel knowledge keeper Ruben Quinn, uh, as part of their English and film studies course at the U of A. So in their course description, their class is described as a response to the TRC calls to action, particularly the call to respect and honor treaties. And it uses the written Nehiawewin or Plains Cree language of syllabics or spirit markers to teach about treaty. And according to Stuart, her and Quinn wanted to find ways to teach within a context of love, where Nehiawewin and the spirit of treaty flourish, and where the end of the illegal occupation of settlers comes into view. And so the purpose of the class is to compose the treaty poetics, to develop a practice, a making of, and an embodiment of good relations with the territory of Treaty 6 and with each other. And so Quinn introduces Nehiao oral history, law, and cosmology, and for some students, radically different ways of thinking and being. And Ruben's uh, pedagogy also highlights this expansive network of relations. So he smudges, he works with prayer, storytelling, song, drumming, and again, oral history. So just in closing, structurally, I think decolonial indigenization or, you know, this idea of collective agendas and wills could mean the university taking on a treaty-like parallel dual structure for teaching Indigenous and non-Indigenous curricula that truly exists in autonomous relationality with one another. So that's it. Exit. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this has just been amazing. Uh, Sarah is last and um, not least, and then we'll open up for conversation and uh, and comments and questions. There, there are a few questions already in the chat, but we'll we'll wait for for Sarah before we uh, before we ask them. Over to you, Sarah. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I do want to say I, I was very lucky enough to have Dr. Ravawa as the supervisor and take his class on African colonialism and human rights. So I can say as a professor, he definitely practices what he preaches. Um, and I think looking at this topic, I feel as though my student experience and my teaching experience um, towards decol decolonializing democratic education, I think are similar both academically and just experiencing the world. Um, and looking at it, I think we teach and learn history while simultaneously living it. And decolonization is more modern than we think. And we have international students who have experienced colonialism and decolonialism firsthand. And I think that's why it's so important to introduce it in classrooms because, you know, it creates a space to have dialogue with the purpose of searching for other ways of thinking, um, you know, and thinking off the experience of life. And, you know, decolonial pedagogy, um, it implies that we critically understand history, but I think along with critically understanding it within a classroom of learning and feeling and these lived experiences, you should also approach it empathetically and allow students lived experiences to inform your practice. Um, and I think that's what's informed my practice, especially while I was a TA. I had students in history and peace and justice classes who would you know, reflect on their home countries where they're now refugees or their current experiences and allowing how we understand history to change as we live it. Um, and as a student, um, focusing my thesis on a crisis in the African Union, it was very clear in research to focus on individual experiences that are lost. So focusing on the micro history that's lost because of the focus on the macro. And I think that's a call back to a class I had with Dr. Avawa about colonialism in Africa you know, how we can find and highlight the trees in the forest. Um, and I think in classrooms especially, you know, there's an expectation for students to retain this knowledge and focus on academic skills, especially in traditional classes. You know, we're reflecting that with term papers and tests or quizzes, you know, but I think there is a way, especially how everyone's spoken before about mobilizing knowledge in a way that makes class more participatory with students, you know, reflecting democratic and decolonization topics with projects that, you know, reflecting their understanding of it and how students define knowledge and how they retain information. And um, like an example, like a, a class on community, there's a way to make it engaging with the community. Or, you know, the idea of giving a voice back to marginalized communities, reflecting a project that uses their voices, whether that's a podcast or, 
a video forum or just social media. And I think that, I think that also um, goes with my inspiration for how I confront systematic challenges um, with approaches to democracy. I think that really stems from my interest in digital media because I think the digital form has changed how we understand and consume democracy. And the world has become a lot smaller because of it. And we have access to seeing how democracy is changing in real time and how people are participating differently around the world. And I think what's really interesting about how we understand democracy, especially how it's taught in undergraduate classes, we're learning democracy understood through a Western lens and then threats to democracy are usually placed in non-Western societies. And I think the focus on the global South or indigenous perspective, you know, provides a perspective of what democracy looks like somewhere else and how it's effective in a way that it might not be able to be understood in a Western or Eurocentric lens. And I think the concept, that I think that concept really inspired me once I understood it, especially research-wise, the idea of flipping the narrative of of not what we define democracy as, but where we define it. So if there's a focus on threats to democracy and human rights crises in the global South, that's probably where conversations of democracy are happening the most. So instead of applying Western thoughts of democracy and applying it there, you know, it became very clear in my research and just being a student to analyze how people are participating in those communities because of their circumstances and then using a comparative lens to see how it's similar or different on the local and global level. So, yeah, thank you, I guess that's my contribution. Amazing, thank you so, so much to um, four panelists who bring together the questions of knowledge production as well as practice, um, not as separate things. Um, but how we think about those in relation to, to our classrooms, how we think about the university and what we used to say, and I'm, I'm, I'm dating myself, um, you know, 30 years ago in South Africa, universities are sites of struggle, right? That, that the, these spaces and opportunities for fundamental transformation as um, everyone's been talking about in respect of both how knowledge is produced and also how we engage students, how students are engaged in the classroom, right? So we speak about democracy or decolonization in the context of institutions that are deeply authoritarian, whether they're neoliberalizing institutions of higher learning or, you know, um, you know classroom school or, or, you know, whatever the site is. So thank you so much for those really rich contributions. Um, I wish we could have taken more time with all of you actually, but here yeah, we have more time. So, so over to the floor um, for, for questions, um, comments, anybody else's experience that they would like to share. Um, this is your opportunity. There is a question um, in the chat, I think directed at, at Kathy, um, from Mariam, are, are students required to cite their ancestors is the question. That's a really good question. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I think it depends. It depends on, on the ancestor. Um, I mean, there is, uh, there's a format now for, for citing oral histories. So um, that would fall under, potentially fall under um, citing an ancestor. If it's a story that's been handed down through your ancestral line, then then yeah. So I guess the the short answer would be, um, you know, yes. But again, I, it also depends on uh, what methodology they're really using. I think to employ it, if it's more of a um, family history, autoethnographic positionality type of thing, then, you know, maybe not. So it, it would depend on the context. But I think that um, the thing I wanted to just emphasize is the, is the bringing in of the intergenerational knowledge that's really important. Yeah, for sure. Kathy, and thanks so much for that, because I've had students often in my classrooms asking if they can do oral mm -hmm. interviews. And it's all complicated with, you know, ethics and who do we, you know, so, so to have a guideline for, for how to approach that is, is really, really important. Um, okay, Actually, just thanks. Yeah, sorry, Kathy, go ahead. 
I was going to say, I actually had a non-Indigenous student one time do um, a reflective piece on this one uh, weekly module. It was an online course, and uh, and they brought in the uh, a conversation that they'd had with their grandpa, and I just <laughs> I thought that was pretty awesome too. So you know, so they want to do it. So this yeah, is for sure. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Shall I read them? Um, the people who are, are raising the questions in the chat, you're welcome to raise them verbally. Um, just stick your little uh, Zoom hand up. And, um, but, but in the meantime, there's, there's a question that asks, what happens if we abandon the teaching imperative, the colonial model of it? What could our classroom become if the starting point is encounter love relationality, transformation, rather than participating in or reproducing imperialism? And that's a question for anyone, huge question for anyone. And let me read the second question while you're contemplating that first question. Um, this is directed specifically at Bonnie or, or Azucena, both, to address the question of how we deal with the situation in which decolonial discourse by authoritarian thinkers who questioned democracy itself, right? So there's, in, in other words, there's not a simple relationship, direct relationship necessarily between decoloniality and democracy. We can't assume a relationship. We have to build one. Um, so yes, so whoever wants to, to have a go at either of those questions. Maybe make it, maybe I can start with the first mm -hmm. question about what uh, would the classroom look like if we adopt this decolonial, more empathic, empathic approach. Uh, my answer, my short answer will be the possibility of different outcomes of, of, of a different kind of student, of a different kind of learner, and ultimately of a different kind of society. And I'll just give a quick example. Um, after the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, released its report, uh, the CBC, which is the uh, well, kind of uh, state-run media here, did a series uh, on truth and reconciliation. You know, a lot of people saw it, and I can tell you how many people said, including many I know, and these are well-meaning people, well-educated people, who said, "I never knew that." I didn't know that. Um, and you've got to ask yourself, what would society have looked like if more people knew that earlier on? And how much pain and suffering and injustice could have been not avoided, you know, but maybe addressed much earlier on if more people had known that? Um, and, and that's really interesting for me, uh, that if we can make the classroom a crucible for these kinds of conversation earlier on, that there is a real possibility of a different kind of society. Um, and, and we all agree that there are large-scale problems to be addressed, whether it's bridging equity gaps. We have big global and national problems to be addressed. And it seems to me a no-brainer that we begin within the confines of the classroom uh, where we work. And I have to admit that's just one little part of society, but an important one, I might add, uh, that we begin to think about alternative possibilities. And this is what the decolonial lens brings to the table, uh, a different way of thinking about how society is ordered that might. And I think that is why the question of why uh, you know, it's really important to this because not everyone is sold on the idea of decolonizing democracy or pedagogies. For many, it's working. It's worked for 100 years. It's worked okay. for generations. Why decolonize anything? In any case, colonialism has formally ended. That's what some think. So those of us who do this work must really go back to the basis and not just assume uh, that the need for these new approach is given. We need to constantly at least let those who might not understand, understand why this is important. If we want a better society, if we want to address big problems in the world, we need to think differently. And a decolonizing approach 
provides us a way of doing that. I'll let others on the panel address the other question on the link between democracy and decolonization. So, Bonnie, I want to take a course with you <laughs> as my teacher. <laughs> He's learned so much. Thank you for that. I just wanted to to add that, you know, Paul, that's such a an awesome question. And I wrote it down because I just think it really um, I think that is for me that 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 kind of is uh, gets to the heart of uh, decolonial democratic education. Um, and for me, I feel that, you know, a context of love or compassion is necessary for truth to happen is what I would say. If you really want to, you know, be able to see and hear and have an actual dialogue with people in a holistic way that you need, to, you need to be in that sort of context, that empathetic, compassionate um, um, context, that, that ethical component, I think needs to be present. Um, and there's, there's a lot of Nehiao um, uh, thinkers that they talk about that. They talk about this idea of ethical relationality and how we are in an intersubjective space with one another and we need to bring you know, uh, an ethics to that space in order to really um, learn from one another. Um, and also there's this idea of compassionate mind as well that um, again, brings to this idea of like, our minds must also be grounded uh, in compassion, so my thoughts um i have a hand up from mariam yeah um so my question goes back to like the decolonial approach within the classroom and within teaching and um i was wondering whether a decolonial approach toward teaching could realistically be implemented and i say this because i feel like society is set up in this particular way on purpose to advance the interests of a few and um perhaps decolonializing education will not be um like possible because of this and so realistically like this is for any of the panelists what types of efforts or approaches and movements do you feel like would be required to realistically implement this method of teaching and for it to last throughout decades of education thank you so much Miriam. and if i can just also pose another question to the panel because i'm mindful of our time um so so there's a question from isabella um, who has used autoethnography in a course in order to deepen an understanding of students' positiona uh, positionality and lived experience. Um, and Isabella asks, what advice might you have for using autoethnography while teaching with the decolonial approach? I'm thinking of the, ch she's thinking of the challenges um, of peer review as a tactic, reviewing part of each other's auto ethnography. So if we can maybe apply our minds to both of those questions um, and perhaps also sum up some key issues that you'd like to leave us with. I'll, so just, add very I'll just start very quickly. I think those two questions are related. And my simple answer to the question posed as to how do we do this? Is this going to be possible, this decolonial approach? I'm optimistic, but it will take work. And I think the second question points to that. Uh, the academia still doesn't uh, uh, accept the approaches that seek to decolonize pedagogies as rigorous. That's something we hear very often. I've said to certain many tenure committees, I've reviewed many files, many journal articles. And although everyone speaks the language of decolonizing uh, pedagogy, I can assure you, uh, that when these methods end up for evaluation, there's a tendency to dismiss them as not rigorous. So, well, you interviewed your ancestor. Well, that's not really an interview. That's not an academic paper. That's an activist paper. Uh, well, you're reading all these obscure authors from the global south. Well, they're not published in the first read journal. The impact factor isn't quite high. So that's not a rigorous PhD reading list. We hear all of this. But I think it is important for those of us who do this work to emphasize, to insist, we have to think about it as a movement and say, yes, uh, this article might not have been published in the most prestigious journal by Western standard, but it speaks to an important theme. It's an important voice and it deserves to be a part of the canon. Uh, and I think that's it. It's going to be a struggle, uh, but it's not impossible. We have to keep at it. And I'm optimistic someday the academia, uh, uh, the, the, the university and the classroom will get this, but it will take a lot of work. 
Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, anyone else from the panel? We've got a minute left. I'm happy to stick around for a little bit longer if others can stay for, say, another five minutes just so that we can round up. And there's a question from Harun. Um, would that be okay with the panelists who are still here? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Cool. So, so Harun will be the last question, and then the the panelists can try and engage with the the question and perhaps round up um, some key points to leave us with. Harun, go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm calling from Cape. I'm I'm following from Cape Town. Uh, this is a very interesting topic, and even more so in South Africa. Decolonization in higher education has widely been debated. Part of the reason is for the ever growing debate on decolonization in South Africa is more associated with student with growing student frustration and dissatisfaction with what has been termed as a colonial symbols in higher education. Uh, this leads to the roads must fall movement uh, that was one of the critical uh, part of the colonization processes. Marginalization of African values in African education has resulted in general westernization of educational theories and practices in Africa. And uh, what uh, Professor Bani have said so much related to what's happening in South Africa. And I'm sure I don't have a lot of time to talk more, but we can we can talk more on this you know, in, in future. In future forums. Uh, thank you so much, and I really enjoyed the, the talk. Uh, for instance, now African values and African traditions has so much it can offer uh, to peace building and peace development. For instance, for instance, if you look at uh, the Horn of Africa, where there are so many conflicts, uh, a case example is Somaliland. Mm -hmm. The traditional society sat together and solved the problem in a traditional way. Uh, without any Western interference. This is a knowledge. This knowledge should be developed further. And this should be, you know, this should be said to the other, other countries. So I think that there's so many things that can be learned from indigenous system. There's so many no things can be learned from the forgotten colonized system. And uh, I'm sure I don't have a lot of time, we'll have to talk more. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Arun. And you've actually reminded me if anyone has ideas for future cafes, please uh, do put them in the in the chat. We would love to hear what other, um, you know, what additional things you'd like us to to organize, what additional panels or extensions of this panel. Um, we'd be really happy to hear from you about what you'd like to, to engage further on. Um, back to the panel. If you can just sum up or, you know, uh, conclude, that would be wonderful. Anyone? Well, I'll prefer Zero. to defer to my colleagues on the panel, but if no one wants to speak, I can <laughs> just say thank you so much. It's been a wonderful, wonderful conversation. I think we need spaces for these kinds of conversation. I'm glad that Batispedia will put in it on their YouTube uh web we'll be putting it on our youtube um this this will be good material for teaching because very often people ask what exactly do you mean by decolonizing academia or pedagogy just send them the link to this video thank mm -hmm. you yeah i i agree bonnie it's um it's been really really informative and the, the combination of both the thinking around it and also the practice of it is really useful. I mean, for me as a teacher, I have lots of tips for, you know, for how to engage and, and democratize my classroom. Um, you know, just not, not just in terms of what I'm teaching, but how I'm teaching, which has been really remarkable. So thank you so much to the panel. Anything else? Um, Anyone else want to contribute? I just wanted to say thank you again. I was really, it was really wonderful. It was a really wonderful hour. Uh, I learned a lot. Yeah, so yeah, absolutely. Um, so again, thank you so much to the panel and to everyone for, for joining us. And we look forward to, to seeing you again soon at uh, our next teaching cafe. Um, we will...
uh, we'll be posting in our newsletter. So if you want to sign up to our newsletter, Jesse, do you want is the newsletter in, in the chat um, where you can you can link to our newsletter and sign up for um, you know so that you can be informed of, of any future events. But also please do be in touch and let us know um, you know what topics, what ideas you would like us to to take further. Thank you all so much for a wonderful, wonderful gathering. Bye, everybody. Have a nice day, evening.